Welcome everyone to day two of the fabulous, fantastic networking track of Linux Blender's conference. Um, that's right, that deserves a round of applause. Uh, we have a welcoming kind of session scheduled, but I really don't have anything extra to add compared to yesterday because everything went smoothly as planned, except no one took advantage of the uh, alcohol for their session, so I've taken it away. You guys don't deserve it. <laughs> I'll bring it to a more appreciative audience to use. But that aside, uh, I'm just going to talk randomly about networking development, and maybe we can have a kind of nice room little discussion. You can ask me questions and stuff like that, because we've got to kill 20 minutes somehow. Uh, people are mostly behaved, which is cool. It makes my job a lot easier. Uh, some things that I really want to see consistently done, uh, you got to provide a fixes tag. I mean, it's, if you don't put a fixes tag there for a bug fix, it's like give me a house and not give me the key to open the front door. Um, as part of my workflow, well, I've improved it recently, but basically every single patch that's a bug fix, I look at the fixes tag and I kind of figure out does it go to stable? What does it depend upon? Where did the bug get introduced? How far back in stable do I have to go? Did I put the thing in the, the commit from the fixes tag into the stable releases too? So I have to recursively reevaluate <laughs> the whole backporting thing, which is, uh, so imagine if I didn't have that fixes tag, how much work is involved there? It's just like, I'm guaranteed to mess everything up. So we need to fix this tag. 12 digits of SSA1 ID in the fixes tag, please, at least. Uh, and put that header text in there with parentheses and double quotes. I'll push your patch back if you don't do that. Uh, one issue that's come up and was brought up by Florian Fanelli, which maybe I want to, I think we need some more brain power towards is we have all, our driver API is a mess. Everyone understands that. It's, it's, I, I'm so glad I'm not writing a, driver these, a new driver these days because it's really difficult. It's not easy. I'm sorry. <laughs> but one area of concern is we have multiple ways to program flows, class, flow classification into the drivers. We have the RxNFC Eve tool business. We've got class flower. And Florian's question was, if you implement both, how should they behave? If you insert a flower rule, what does the RxNFC thing return? What can you can you modify entries by index, and then what does the flower stuff look like if you query it if, when you change with the other API? No one, see, everyone's got this look on their face, this thousand miles there. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say my, my, uh, about you gotta talk to the box. Hello, box. Yeah, I'm presenting about that today, Dave, so thank you for bringing that up. What a great <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> I know you've, uh, you've had issues with our driver APIs over the years. Uh, one suggestion you've made that I, we haven't followed up on is docu documenting this whole, the mess that we have. Like, it's one thing to have a mess, it's another thing to have a mess that no one understands completely because we haven't documented it. So documentation is a clear way forward to solve this mess, I think. Right, so uh, hey, there's a, there's a plug for, uh, it's not in my paper, or my presentation. Um, I, I was looking through the network documentations, netdevice.h and whatever else, uh, other pieces, especially dev.c. There's a lot of places where we could put in deoxygen headers. The content's all there already. It just needs to be reformatted, mostly. That's um, good to hear. You know, a lot of it's there. So I think that we could, you know, it'd be an easy task for someone to take on that wasn't super um, you know, technical to help start formatting those into uh, the KDOC style, I guess. Awesome, that's um, great to know. And then the other thing I wanted to ask about in documentation space is, should we be converting some of our stuff to RST? Some people are trying to do that, and uh, I'm trying to encourage people to work piecemeal. Like, don't go and do a whole subdirectory under documentation and do like 20 files. That's like, no one's gonna review that. I guess, I guess that gets to a more general thing about uh, what makes a patch series reviewable and easy to digest and what's likely to get people to review your stuff rather than ignore your changes. 
If you come onto the list with a 40 patch series, not only am I gonna just say push back on you, but no one's gonna look at it. Like seriously, no one but your coworkers are gonna look at it. I can guarantee you this. Uh, so then, so then, then we have the the logical consequence of that is like, okay, I have the 60 patch series, so I'm gonna send 18 at a time, but without any logical grouping whatsoever. <laughs> This is a situation where the cure is almost worse than the disease. Uh, you should really think about providing a logical thing in those little sets of changes. I think David Ahern does this well when he's trying to get somewhere. He's like, I'm trying to reach this destination. It's 60 patches down the road, but I'm gonna make this piece of infrastructure that you can see how it's used and there is usage of it in these like little 12 to 14 patch series and I, I really like that. That's like a, that's a pleasure to read. Uh, you know that you've split up your patch series correctly if you're reading every patch and saying of course, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course, obviously, 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 obviously. You should never be like, <laughs> how does he call this function? What's, what's the call chain? How, is he locking this? Like, if you're asking those kind of questions, the, the patch series hasn't been broken down correctly. It's too hard to review, and uh, that's something people should avoid. Um, trying to think if there are any pain points. Oh, so uh, I'll talk some more about stable. So what I used to do is I would just, everything that I said queued up for stable would go into that bundle on patchwork, right? And then when I decide to do a stable submission, I undo the bundle and I would look through to get history and extract all the, the commits out and then I'd put the upstream commit blah 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 text into the commit message, file them into sub subdirectories such as there'd be, a, I have a, a directory called Q and underneath Q there's V.4.17, V.4.18 and backwards and forwards and if the fixes tag told me that the bug was introduced in 4.17, that's where I would put that back port. If it went beyond get history, it went to the top level directory, or I, I think the, the bug's been around forever, even though the fixes tag says something else. I try to do a little bit of interpretation here and there. Uh, but that was time consuming, so the whole pulling, extracting the patches out from <coughs> Linus's tree or my own tree just take, took forever. So what I do now is that when I queue something up for stable, I extract the patch out of my own tree because it's the top level commit at that point and it's a hell of a lot faster than searching through git history and then I put the upstream commit blah 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 and I put it into the queue subdirectory and then it's all sitting there waiting for me when I do a stable submission and that is like a thousand times faster I should have been doing that just like 10 years ago so that's my process for stable stuff um, people have asked me why do you why do you do it the special way or whatever I, I just I can't wrap my brain around the, the idea that just because a patch made it into Linus's tree, it should go straight to stable, that it doesn't compute. Like, one out of every four patches will have a follow-on small bug fix a week later. Isn't that the truth? Right? So I'm trying to fight that effect so that the patch doesn't jump into stable with that little bug in it that needs a fix a, a week later. I really want things to cook in my tree and Linus's tree for a week or two before I send it off to Greg and the stable folks. And it's just, I think it saved us a lot of grief because we've been doing it this way. The bad part is it's not automated like the CC stable thing is and is a lot of extra work for me, but I think the increase in quality of the backports that end up in stable is worth the extra work that I'm putting now. And as I just described, I've kind of re reduced the, the amount of work I spend into this a lot. So. If people disagree with me, say something, but I think it's working well, and I think I communicate with people, and I think I tell people exactly what they need to do to get things into stable, and there's no misunderstanding, so. Cool. Any particular pain points with development, generally speaking, with networking, I wanna hear about it. Like, here's, here's your chance, I'm here, my ears are open. Okay, so I'll, oh, Eric, here's the microphone. get the, the box. <laughs> I want to to uh, to point of the importance of the fixed tag. That really helps all the backlog, uh, the backport we do, and all the stable teams do. So, if everybody can agree, adding this fixes tag, it would be awesome.
So a question to that. How much does Shatter's automagic thing mess up your workflow? Whose automatic thing? There's one that's looking through patches. Oh, okay, so, so here's the situation there. I only have bandwidth to backport two releases back. I mean, if, once you get to the third or fourth, the amount of work you have to do increases exponentially because the tree just changes that much. Mm -hmm. I've kind of handed off what happens beyond that to whatever disabled folks want to do. And yes, I, I see how they automatically backport stuff and sometimes people go, whoa, that's not even relevant back there or whatever like that. So it, it wouldn't be a stretch to say it's a kind of ad hoc situation and there's not a lot of control going into it. So yeah, it, it is a concern for the people using those older trees by far. Any suggestions? Yeah, because I, if I get involved then I'll disappear for two days instead of one day when I'm doing stable backports. And I don't know if you guys like waiting extra days for your patches to get applied. And you probably don't. So like, I think I'm going to continue down the path I'm in now. But it's, it is a real point. Thanks for bringing it up. Mm -hmm. um, so about the, the stable, do all, like some fixes tags are, go really far back. But, yeah. the, but the actual bug is pretty small and the risk of introducing a bigger one is actually pretty great. So I guess two questions, like if I know that it has to go back and the tree has changed a lot, does it help if I do the busy work of creating the stable backport, particularly because we have our own internal distros everywhere? Awesome, Thank, thanks for bringing this up. Okay, and so the second one, do we not backport some of them? And should we like, put that in the patch, like don't, you know, in my opinion, don't. Okay, so. I run into trouble sometimes when I backport, and I ask for help. Sometimes I say, I, I like, hey, like Kong Wang will like touch something in the entire packet scheduler layer to fix some bug, and I'm like, dude, in three releases back, I, I can't, I can't do this. This is just. So I do ask for help when I need it. Uh, if you, if you preemptively know that there's a lot of churn, mm -hmm. having the backport available helps a lot. But get it into my tree first, and then provide. Then say I'll provide backports because really so and so is going to be a difficult one. That helps a lot. Okay. Uh, what to do about the small, fix big risk for breakage? It depends. It would be I have to be evaluated on a case by case basis. But I understand the situation you're talking about. Sometimes I see a fix and I'm just like that is, that is not worth pushing the stable. This is just going to. <coughs> more problem like we ran into a situation like that with the UFO removal fixes we kept going back and forth and we were we were breaking as much as we were fixing at, at one point uh, so that was that's a, that, that's when it comes to mind because I was directly involved in that um, do you have any specific examples because maybe we can uh, evaluate a specific situation and think about how we would wrap our brains around a similar situation. Uh, I guess there are a lot of these like, small syscaller fixes. There was a one with a race condition uh, where you downgrade a V6, a V4 math V6 to a V4 socket and that's not an atomic operation. Like, who Do we really care? This has been there since I think the beginning of Git. I think I know which one you're talking about. I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Syscaller finds a lot of weird stuff that's just like, yeah, whatever. It's, it's good to fix it, but well, I, no I one noticed, and it's there not. Are, a I think a lot of the AF packet races were like in that in that kind of category too. Some, not all yeah. of them. Some of them were very serious, but some of them were like, this yeah. is not happening. But yes, we have to fix it. <sighs> See the thing about the P six P four one. I wouldn't want it on my head that that I could fix that in stable if I wanted to, and I'm not going to. Okay. Because that thing did crash. That one did crash because it did reference garbage, right? Um, no, it actually. Okay. Okay. Well. <laughs> so there's the, the does it does it crash the system consideration, and there's the could someone use it to do nefarious stuff? So. See, it's not easy to evaluate stable backports at all. I guess. It's uh, even if someone asked me explicitly, I would I, I have to double check. I just I just have to do it. So that's a good question, though. Like, what's the evaluation process? I, I really depend, on, at least to a certain extent, upon the submitter to kind of brief, give me a brief if necessary. Like, 
you know, you, you, you put the commit message and you go dash, 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 and you can add notes to just like, write a novel there if you need to, to help me understand the backboard situation. Like do not, never hold back on commit message and note area verbiage. The more information you can provide, the better. I'd rather have to read a novel than get stuck with a backboard and not know what I'm doing. So, some people want to also, ah, this drives me nuts. Uh, they'll do revisions on either an individual patch or a patch series, and they'll try to hide from the commit message to change log. Don't hide the change log. Keep it in there so that it goes into the Git history. Why? Because someone down the road is going to go back to your patch series or your patch and be like, you know, I would have suggested that they do X, Y, and Z. And they could see in the change log that, oh, I changed from this thing that you think they should have done to this other thing based upon feedback. So, like, you know that that idea was considered already and they, there was an explicit reason why that approach wasn't taken. So, you don't even have to go back to the mail the discussion back on NetDev or wherever, which is impossible to find, it's right there in the commit history why is the change went in a certain direction and ended up looking a certain way it did at the end. So I think that's very valuable. So do not try to elide the change log from commit messages ever. I'm, I'll put it in there if you try to remove it. I'll just move it back in there. I don't care. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, stable. Stable's kind of an interesting situation. It's good that people are asking questions. Uh, anything else? We're doing on time. One more minutes. Three more minutes. Okay, so I guess we'll just uh, get ready for Andrew's talk and we'll move on. Oh, and be careful of Colonel shenanigans. We learned yesterday to shield ourselves from Colonel shenanigans. Andrew has been a very valuable contributor to our team for some time now. Uh, unless you've been under a rock, uh, he's been working on DSA and five drivers and helping review a lot of code that goes to the list too. So uh, he was in at NetConf in Toronto last year and he helped us with the technical no, committee for NetDev. Uh, so he's all over the place and uh, we really appreciate his, his help. Without further ado, Andrew. Thank you. So we're going a bit lower than, than usual. We're going to the Mac and Phi. I want to talk about some work that was merged recently, which will help Mac drivers, people who are writing Mac drivers for those who are doing greater than one gigabit per second, which might seem a bit strange when most of you are talking about 40 gig, 100 gig. But in reality, look at your laptop. If it's got an RJ45, it's probably got a one gig RJ45 on it. Your desktop, probably still one gig. But things change when we go from one gig to faster than that, especially in the embedded world. And a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about has come from the embedded world and is going to be more generalized and usable for others. I looked at the history for the last couple of months. What drivers have been merged recently? They're all multi-gig. There was no one gig driver merged. So we can see that one gig is coming to its end of its life. Everybody's going to have faster Ethernet soon. With the one exception that proves the rule, there was this weird FDDI driver, <laughs> <laughs> which is probably a museum piece, but I think that shows the flexibility of Linux. If you submit quality code and you're going to maintain it, you can have it. <laughs> so if you've got any more museum pieces you want to support, I'm sure Dave will accept it. So it all started, like I said, from the embedded area. This is one of Marvel's boards built by Solidron, clay fog. And it's got an SFP in the middle, which is this silver bit with fiber optic cables coming out, which you don't really see much yet around the home. It's something you'll see in the data center, but it's slowly becoming more popular, especially in industrial settings, airplanes. They want the light weight of fiber rather than copper. And then after that came this interesting board, which is more of a reference design. It brings everything out you could ever want from this chip. But the interesting things here are it's got three SFPs and it's got two 10 gig ethernets, which for an embedded system, yeah, that's pretty powerful. But that's the way things are going. And it can also do 2.5 and 5 gig. So 
So these were probably the first boards in the embedded space to do this. They've been around for a long time. If you look at Ethernet switches, but in the embedded space, yeah. What was also novel is that in the embedded space, often there's no firmware driving this. It's Linux, which is nice because we can fix the bugs. When the firmware is broken, there's nothing we can do. So there was no real support for 10 gig. There was no real support for SFPs. And Russell King, he was given the task, invent something, make it work. We want this in mainline. And Russell King being Russell King, he went away, studied lots of different things, decided what we have doesn't work, and invented something new. So yes, it's a new API, but it's documented. <laughs> and most of you don't need to care about it because it's one of those low-level ones, really bottom of the Mac into the Phi, which there's only a few specialist people who do that. So what is an SFP? Small, form, factor, pluggable. It's hot pluggable, which that makes it interesting. Normally, you don't pull your Ethernet file off your PCB and put it back again. With these, you can. And that causes problems in lots of places where it just doesn't expect it to disappear and come back again. That was one of the main reasons we needed a new API. The interface to the Mac is also different, at least compared to one gig. It's a SADES interface. It's not a parallel bus. That brings with it some issues. And then there's a control plane, I squared C, for something that looks like an EEPROM, but it's not an EEPROM, really. And you've got some GPR lines, loss of signal, turn off the transmitter so you don't blind anybody. And you can also check, has anybody actually plugged a module in? Useful to know. And a block diagram and SFP stolen from some vendor site. So at the top, you can see the transmit path. A data stream comes in. It's turned into light and sent out. It's totally passive. It doesn't do anything except for electrical to light. And then the opposite direction, light to electrical. Which is somewhat unusual when you think of normal files. They're going out to negotiation. They're talking to each other. There's lots of things going on. Here, nothing. It's done. And at the bottom, you've got some more of the control plane. There's temperature sensors. There's voltage centers. You can tell if the thing's overheating or it's frozen. Things like that. Again, industrial. It's got to work at minus 20. The interesting thing is, when is it up? When do you actually have link? Because you don't have a phi talking to another phi. Things get pushed backwards a bit. It's now the Mac needs to know or tells you when is the link up. It's not the phi. The IEEE, they seem to like all their sublayers in various things. And it's, this is where it comes in here as well. So we have inside the Mac, a Mac. <laughs> and then a reconciliation layer. It's just a bit of glue. And then the real interesting bit here is the PCS, the physical coding subsystem. It takes the byte stream from the Mac and turns it into bits. And it does a bit of extra encoding. And it's also known as the SADES, the serializer deserializer. To determine that you've got a link end-to-end, -end, firstly, loss of signal has to be false, i.e. there's some sort of light coming in, although it won't tell you much about the light. It's just the right wavelength. And the PCS has to say, I've got sync. There's a clock signal that I understand the basic bit stream. You've also got to try and configure these things in that, again, there's no auto on the gag. The SFP will tell you a bit about itself in its EEPROM. What board rate does it support? In this case, a little example in the corner, 4.2. That's a fiber channel SFP. But you can also use it for networking. That's sufficient to be able to do 1,000 base X and 2,500 base X, which gets confusing. Because what can the Mac do? What can the SFP do? The two have got to decide, right, I'm going to do this. So there needs to be some sort of negotiation between the Mac and the Phi. 
And that doesn't normally exist with one gig. You've got a one gig Mac, you've got a one gig fine, they talk to each other, everybody's happy. You also got the problem is what is the other end doing? Is it also trying to do one gig or is it trying to do 2.5 or whatever? So it's a lot more manual to set up. For really for SFPs to make it mainstream, somebody needs to think about auto negotiation. For a data center where everything's under good control, no problems. But if you think about fiber to the home or fiber in the home, somebody needs to think about plug and play. And then back to copper. When is a copper link up? And that's slightly different here to single gig to multi gig because of this SADES line between the Mac and the Phi. That's got to be configured to the right speed for what the whole chain is. Yet more layers within the various sections. But the interesting thing here is the PCS going to the PCS going to the PCS. They've reused part of their standards to give you the Mac to Phi link. And then they use the same block again to do you Phi to Phi over the cable. So you've got a SADES talking to a SADES, effectively. And you've got all the configuration issues with that. To determine it's up, the first thing that will happen is the PCS layer will talk to the peer PCS layer and say, I can do this bit, but board rate, at rate, but at rate. What's the common set? We'll pick the highest. And that that's then signals over the MGI bus to the FI driver, and we're ready at the cable ready, the cable is then ready. It will also configure its other PCS for the SADES to the Mac to the right speed. So in this case, it's configured the SADES to 2500 base X. And then the Mac has got to configure its end to the same speed. And then you'll get a sync. So there's lots of steps to go through before you can actually say the link is up. The cable's got to be up, the SADES has got to be up. The classical API that's been around for decades is the file it, you, which is there to represent a phi. It has no concept of all these different pieces in the chain. The Mac driver needs to connect to the phi because there can be multiple phi's out there and you've got to get the one that's actually connected to the Mac. If you're in device tree, if you're in the embedded world, that will tell you where it is. And then you've got to disconnect to the end. When your interface is configured up, you want to tell the phi, hey, talk to the other end. Figure out what link rate we're going to do. So, phi start. When the link goes down, you can save quite a bit of power by turning the phi off. Maybe up to a watt. So it's worth doing it. And then you've got a callback when the phi library tells the Mac library, something just happened. The link came up. Link went down. Link changed, the speed changed, or the pause changed, or whatever. This works well for the old ones, 10, 100, gig, half full, duplex, copper. Doesn't work for what I showed before. It's got problems. It's got limitations. It only supports copper. Fiber didn't exist. No idea of it. Only supports NDIO. That's the normal bus to talk to a phi you get into oddities when you've got an SFP module that isn't optic, it's copper. You can do that. You can have an RJ45 connector on the front. And then you don't have this MDIO bus, you've got this I2C bus. And you can tunnel MDIO of I2C. It's meant to be cold plug. It's on the board. When the power comes on, the fire's there. It doesn't disappear. It doesn't come back again. So it's has some dynamic behavior, but not much. And the Mac is not involved. The Mac, the Phi tells the Mac, we have link, everything's good, go. SFPs, 10 gig Phi's, much more dynamic. <coughs> the module can be plugged, unplugged, anytime. You've got to be able to handle that. You've got to configure this Mac to Phi or Mac to SFP link. 
you've got to handle the different odds and negotiations or the fact there's no odds and negotiation. You've got the weird modes. Sometimes you're running 2,500 base X. Sometimes you're using SGMI clocked up at higher speed. The Mac and the Fi have got to negotiate. What are we actually going to talk to each other? So we introduced, Russell decided to introduce a new, new API to solve all these problems. To try and make it easier to use, he actually kept it quite similar to the old API, rather than invent something completely new. So we have a struct file link, and this represents the whole chain, rather than just a phi. It can handle an SFP. It can handle a phi inside an SFP. It can handle the SADES links. It, it hides all that knowledge into one structure, which then has a number of structures underneath it. You've got to create and destroy this thing. It doesn't just magically appear. But at that point, and because it's coming from the embedded world, it will go look in the device tree and find what it can about this board. Are we expecting there to be an SFP there? Where's the I squared, I squared C bus? What are the GPIOs? Etc. If you're using a soldered down phi, then you need to connect to it in the same way you would do for the pilot. If you're not, if it's hot plug-in, it will just appear. It will tell you, oh, somebody just plugged this module in. Here's what it can do. Also, start, stop, save you a bit of power by turning it off when you don't need it. And one major new call is the Mac can tell the library something just happened. The SEDES is now up. That was completely missing from the old API. That's one of the important functions. And we also have a big long list of callbacks. Well, not so long. <coughs> the validate call is there to make sure that the Mac and the Phi do, are both doing the same thing. They both know that what their capabilities are and negotiate what are we going to do on this link at this time. You can ask the Mac, how do you see the link at the moment? Is it up, down? What rate is it running? You can tell it. You can tell the Mac how to configure itself. What do we expect to be doing over this link at this time? You can restart auto negotiation on the Mac end, which is a bit unusual because it's normally the Phi, but sometimes you need that. And you can force it up or you can force it down. When you don't actually have anything connected to it, in terms of it's connected to an Ethernet switch, not a Phi or an SFP, you just want to force it up which is what we use a lot in DSA. OK, so now you actually want to try and use the thing, documentation. There's a few good uh, examples. The Marvel MV Netta, that's the one that was on, in those boards that Russell used. Hence, it, it supports everything. DSA uses it. So the Ethernet switches that we support, the Marvel Ethernet switch and the Roadcom. Florian's done his bit, I've done my bit. If you want to use fiber connections to Ethernet switches, pick the Malvo ones or Broadcom. It'll work. And then the other one is the MVPPP2. It's work in progress, not the best yet. But it's still something to look at. And there's some kernel doc API for it. Go look at it. When you tend to use core code, you often get freebies. Things that somebody else has implemented that just works for you. If you implement all this yourself, like all the Intel drivers, they've got bits of SFP code, but they don't have, they've had to plumb this bit together themselves. Whereas if you use the central infrastructure, it just works. So you can read what is this SFP, what's in its EPROMs, what temperature is it running at, how much current is it drawing, what is it a fiber optic? How long can it go, et cetera, et cetera. And it's somewhat human readable, sometimes right, and sometimes they even get the checksum right, <laughs> but not often. And the other thing is, like I said, the sensors in there. You can see how hot is this thing, because there's a lot of power going into these. There can be one watt, two watts. And if you've got a board with 12 of them, it can get hot. And hence, you want to use things like HWMON, monitor it and to drive the fan. 
So you just get this for free because the cord was it. And you can see what's the temperature, what's the transmit power, what's the receive power. Is it actually getting it voltage it wants? So go out there and use it, please. <laughs> and I'll review any patches you submit, and I'll tell you what you got wrong and got right. And also, we're a bit limited at the moment with one gig files. There's only one that's really supported well, and that's the Marvel one. It'd be nice if other files were properly supported. And this isn't replacing the file drivers, it's using the file drivers. So don't worry about that. You don't need to write new file drivers. Questions? No. <laughs> oh, yes. I knew Jesse would <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to make any excuses for the Intel drivers because that's a whole <laughs> other hour. So, um, but uh, I did have a question about how you manage um, in this layer, how you manage like maybe incompatible SFP models. So we've noticed from our side that, and I don't, you've probably seen it maybe some too, is that one EEPROMs are just wrong. Yep. And then there's certain things, and you know, some of our products have gone to whitelisting stuff for various reasons, but some of the reason is because a lot of the stuff doesn't work, <laughs> right? Like you plug it in and it fits in the cage, yeah. that doesn't really mean anything to, to how functional it is. And then the other one I wanted to add is that we, we had to do some um, auto, we called it auto try instead of you know, auto negotiate, yeah. right? We were auto trying one 10 gig link speeds because there's these dual modules that'll support both speeds on the same laser. Yeah. So basically, it needs pushback from us to the manufacturers saying, hey, it just doesn't work, fix it. And somebody of your size can probably do that. In the small embedded world, maybe not. The embedded world generally has the advantage. They pick their SFP module, they make, they make sure it works, and then they deploy the same one everywhere. <laughs> can you turn down the volume on the mic? Oh, he's not here. <laughs> so, for example, I know of one, in, one use case is on aircraft, and it's always the same SFP module, they know it works. When, it's, when you're doing embedded systems, you can do that. It's when it gets to consumer that it's going to be a problem. Data center's not going to be a problem, it's going to be consumer. I, I do think he does have a fair point, though, because the hardware is out there. And maybe we should have some mechanism ins inside filing to have a whitelist or some kind of. There is a file, There is a whitelist at the moment for this uh, CRC is wrong. We will accept file uh, SFPs with a broken. If it CRC. has the ID that's in the list. If it's just yeah, it's generally the Cotswolds. They're generally broken in terms of. It looks like they change the serial number and then don't update the CRC. And I, I even think it's to the point where, if I understand Jesse's situation accurately, he knows a list of SAP modules that specifically do not work with his Mac. Yeah. It's so a Mac specific, yeah, a Mac, yeah, a Mac specific white black list of some kind of, of some, something like that. There's a specific SFP driver, and I could see that that driver has kind of a sub-library in it that contains this whitelist. That's how we could share it. I think there needs to be some explicit support for this kind of situation yeah. at some point. Yeah. I think it partially it's because, again, it's from the embedded world. People know what they're doing. I will note off the record that Broadcom acknowledged that there should be something like this as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's just, it takes time to happen, and so far, there's not been that much pain in the embedded world, and it's the embedded world that's driving this. When it comes to consumers, yeah, I can see there's gonna be pain, and then we'll do it. <laughs> so I've been playing with SFP a long time because uh, that's what the Neptune driver used for 10 gig, uh, the, the Sun NIU, and I had no idea about any of this because I just programmed everything directly in my driver, and that's what everyone's been doing, Intel as well. Yeah. So we're all guilty parties in this situation, so. I definitely agree with you that it'd be nice if people move towards infra uh, shared infrastructure and 
some of you may not even believe this, we didn't even have a file layer at one point in the mm -hmm. past and everyone duplicated the state machine and everything inside their Ethernet drivers. So uh, we're a long ways off to where we've been, but we can keep improving, that's for sure. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you.